Good morning everyone. Respected Dr. Murli Mohan Yelapu, Associate Professor, University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley, USA. Dr. Benno Pereira, Assistant Professor, Department of Zoology. Dr. Srijit Parameshwara Panika, Assistant Professor, Department of Zoology, GAN Course Coordinator. I feel privileged to welcome you all on behalf of the Department of Zoology, Advanced Center for Regenerative Medicine and Stem Cell Research in Cutaneous Biology, the University of Kerala, who has clubbed all of us for the five-day GAN course on role of nanonutraceuticals in tissue regeneration in association with Department of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology and Central Laboratory for Instrumentation and Facilitation, University of Kerala. Now I would like to welcome Dr. Srijit P. for the welcome address. Good morning. I am extremely overwhelmed to get the opportunity to address you all on this auspicious occasion of Friday International uh, course on role of nano nutraceutical in tissue regeneration. Uh, this is a part of uh, a GAN program and GAN is actually an initiative by the MHRD uh, Government of India and that actually helped to bring the uh, outstanding researchers from outs uh, outside India and uh, they, they, they can uh, come here and expose with their techniques with the students here. And uh, that is a major advantage of GAN program. And uh, the, another important thing related to GAN is that we are actually um, uh, providing as a MOOC course eventually. And uh, we'll get a uh, lot of other students will also get the opportunity. Uh, that is the purpose of the GAN program initiated by MHRD. And uh, this is our second GAN program. First GAN program we are actually conducted in 2016. And there, that program is actually coordinated by the expert. He actually came from uh, Case Western Reserve University. His name is uh, Professor Scott Havel. He talked ex ex very elaborately about the confocal microscopy for, uh, and uh, the fluorescent microscopy, et cetera. And this course is actually available in Kerala University, uh, KU Padashala. And this is our second program. And uh, this second program is actually initiated with the collaboration of uh, um, uh, Dr. Murili. And we have a, uh, a long time collaboration, around five, six years collaboration is there because we have a common society is there, Society for Nutraceutical and Com uh, Chronic Diseases. And this society is actually uh, conducting uh, programs regularly and uh, that's why we have a strong collaboration is there that's why we propose this proposal to the GAN and the GAN is actually very um, uh, positive positively taken this proposal and funded around 5.68 lakhs rupees to conduct this program and uh, today we have assembled to uh, here to aspire knowledge and to motivate the great task of eminent scholars and I feel proud to welcome our resource person Dr. Murili Mohan Ellapu who will lecturing throughout the coming five days. Thank you, Murali, for your uh, support. And uh, we will uh, see your uh, collaboration in future event also. And uh, many of the students in our, there are MSc students are there, and the PhD students and other students also uh, uh, present in this particular program. And uh, feel, feel to interact with them and uh, give the guidance for how to prepare nanoparticles. And uh, hopefully, it will help them to uh, do research, good research in future, and thank you all, and welcome to all to this particular program. Global initiative of academic networks in higher education was launched in 2015. It is a program of Ministry of Human Resource and Development. GAN is aimed at tapping the talent pool of scientists and entrepreneurs internationally to encourage their engagement with the institutes of higher education in India so as to augment the country's existing academic resources, accelerate the pace of quality reform and elevate <coughs> India's scientific and technological capacity to global excellence. The University of Kerala's GAN course is meant to provide participants with an overview of nanonutraceuticals in tissue regeneration. Nutraceuticals constitute a distinct product category that exceeds food but falls short of pharmaceuticals. A fraction of the supplied nutraceuticals get absorbed and reach the actual pharmacological site of action, while the remainder is either excreted or cause non-specific non toxicity and severe side effects due to poor biodistribution. To address these issues, nanonutraceuticals have been developed using nanotechnology principles for the efficient delivery of nutraceuticals. Nanonutraceuticals are the standardized and characterized bioactive substances used to regulate stem cell function, prevent diseases, penetrate the skin, and regenerate tissues. This course helps students comprehend the significance of nutraceuticals to human health. This workshop will be directed under the guidance of Dr. Murli Mohan Gelapu, Associate Professor at the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley, USA. 
He is a tenured associate professor of the Immunology and Microbiology Department and a member of the South Texas Center of Excellence in Cancer Research at the School of Medicine, University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley, McKellen, Texas, USA. He is a recipient of the Professor A. Kamishwara Rao's Gold Medal 1999. He was received his PhD degree in Polymer Science and Technology and completed postdoctoral training in Material Science, Drug Delivery, Nanomedicine and Cancer Biology from Cleveland Clinic, University of Nebraska Medical Center, Sanford Research and Guangzhou Institute of Science and Technology. Before joining the UTRGV, Dr. Gellapu served as Assistant Professor at the Department of Pharmaceutical Science, the University of Tennessee Health Science Center. Dr. Yalapu has been serving as editorial board member for various drug delivery, nanotechnology and cancer related journals. He has been an ad hoc reviewer for NIH and various other funding agency study sections. He has published over 175 peer reviewed articles and reviews in journals, book chapters and over 125 conference abstracts. His work was cited over 13,132 times with an age index of 56 and an item index of 134. His current research primarily focuses on the development of nanomaterials for the improved therapeutic potential of the clinical drugs and the development of new constructs for biomedical application. Welcome you, sir. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Can you hear me well? Good. So, I thank everyone to be here on this uh, new uh, course day. You know, initially I thought that you know it would be a small group, you know, five or six people, and then they are getting hands-on training on nanotechnology. And later I realized, you know, master students, PhD, and also some of the uh, newer faculty they want to learn how to use nanotechnology in various fields, particularly regenerative nanomedicine. So 20 years ago, I started doing research. That time I'm a graduate from a chemistry department. Then I thought I would do organic chemistry. And I got admission into organic chemistry and also polymer science. I thought that time, you know, polymer science is a, an emerging field. I would get benefit if I would join in the polymer science. So that's where, uh, you know, I joined into polymer science. Later on, I realized that, you know, just getting a master degree is not quite enough to do, you know, uh, more advanced studies and do more research and then more uh, recognition and you know, serve the community in some form. So then I started doing PhD. So that time I fortunately working for a DRDO project. So where we started doing research on solid propellant binders. Okay. It's uh, is going to be fuel for the rocket propellants. So that was my PhD. Okay. Later on so during that transition from PhD to postdoctoral fellowship, I started working on hydrogels. Okay, so hydrogels, you know, many of you might be knowing, particularly whoever doing uh, SDS phase gel. Okay, it's nothing but polyacrylamide gel, right? So that time we had the same concept, use the same material, but used for drug delivery or delivering of agrochemicals for you know uh, plant growth and also for to deliver the water uh, for more period of time so then the, the same concept then i introduced putting the nanoparticles into those hydrogels so that's where you see my first cover article it was on 2005 so the the idea remains same okay doing polymer science it's it's remained same, but I pl I applied putting or generating the nano materials in those whatever you make like the acrylamide gel. It's the same acrylamide gel, but if we very different uh, pore size or the networks where we grow some of the nano particles into those. So then I thought, okay, it's it's interesting, right? So you are 
or doing something and excited you know to do more and more then later on i was more interested doing research in nano materials so that time also again i was a new to the field i thought that nano materials means only metal particles like silver nano particles gold nano particles and so on so with the time during the after like you know one postdoctoral fellow i joined in a lab in cleveland clinic so where that case western e reserve university is nearby so where i got training of making nano formulations of various kinds such as polymer nano particles and iron oxide nano particles and nano gels and so on so it's very well like you know i got training into various nano materials and material science polymer science and everything so then i thought that you know everything we are making but how we can use them okay so those labs they were focusing on various aspects like such as applying to the cancer treatment applying to the cardiovascular application applying for brain delivery and so on so i am familiar with the making the materials then how to use them so i was depend on depending on other uh, fellow workers or the uh, fellows that you know they take this material and then they will apply but i never got a chance to learn them so then i moved to uh, a different laboratory within the united states where i got the opportunity to learn biological aspects of these nano material so that's where i first learn culturing the cells okay seeing these cells for the first time under microscope okay that was my first paper in biology everything i did by myself i learned the culturing okay both you know mtt assays proliferation assays running the western blot doing the pcr and everything i learned within a year okay and we got a publication on plga nano particles containing one of the natural molecule called curcumin so we used that uh, and synthesized that material uh, with a chemotherapy drug called cisplatin so why i'm saying this because like many of you might be thinking why we want to learn nanotechnology okay so many of you are may not be aware of that you know how we can use this nanotechnology we can use many ways not just for drug delivery or uh, neutrocytical delivery but but you can use for various applications so here i am uh, today in front of you to give you overview of nano materials how that we can use in various fields but our uh, emphasis would be on delivery aspects of either drug molecules small molecules or bio macro molecules or natural compounds etc okay so i'll be like more interactive and if you have any questions you stop me and then we can discuss more in detail not only now but you know i will be available during this uh, five days you know if any questions you have it's a smaller big you know even if you want to learn more in the near future so i'm leaving my email uh, address here and if really if anybody wants to learn and apply in your uh, field of research i'll be happy to help you and i can put some of the zoom meetings with you individually along with your uh, mentor so that we can do or we can achieve what you wanted to do or how you want to apply this nano technology in your research okay so the first lecture would be giving a brief information about various type of nano materials how we can or how we can visualize them nano material means like is that tiny that we cannot see it right but how one can think how a student think that what is nano material okay so you all might be know that a uh, nano car by tata right it's a nano so how much small it is 
okay so we will learn all those kind of basics and then i'll give you and i make you to go slowly into the field so that you have some uh, more insight into the uh, nanotechnology today so what we are going to learn from this chapter would be learning some of the basic concepts or principles about all these key terminology nano materials nano particles or various type of materials or particles and what is epr and active targeting mechanisms that they explore nano particles explore these property to go into the vasculature or to travel through the blood so that you know they can see or the recruit where the inflammatory site is so how these nanoparticles are exploring this particular property called epr and active targeting and we will see what's the difference between a uh, four major categories of nanomaterials those are polymeric nanoparticles magnetic nano particles nano gels and polymeric micelles and my laboratory on various aspects right from the generating a material applying them or testing them in the in the first area is that we apply that can be a preventive uh, methodology or you can use the same material as a image or are the same methodology that we generate that can also diagnose various type of diseases and also that can be combined both as a therapy and also imaging technology or diagnosis technology that is called theranostics and apart from this uh, our major uh, research thrust we also applied our nano materials uh, technology based on some uh, new ways of uh, detecting the covid or any other diseases right from the serum or any other you know saliva or urine so you can develop some of the test kits that they can uh, detect you know easily kind of like you know point of care technologies and also we applied various nano immuno based so this slide will give you what is nano technology that we thought okay so is that like nano is how much small it is okay so it's a simply if you see that so glucose it's nothing but like you know we all consume uh, sugar every day right so if you see the sugar not the crystal as such sugar a uh, molecule it has a 10 to the power of minus 1 nanometer okay if you see a, any protein if you take any protein like such as bsa or uh, hsa or any major proteins so those that particle size would be or the globular size of that particular protein molecule would be somewhere close to 1 to 5 nanometer so then we keep following like you know viruses are close to 100 nanometer again so the covid starts to starts go to uh, you see the you know structure of the starts go to it's a close to 130 nanometer okay so those are all in nano size range right so if you take any so you all know you know how your cells like various type of cells you culture how they look like but those were ranging size from so you all culture the cells but they they look under the microscope if you visualize them those were somewhere you know a couple of microns 5 to 10 microns or maybe some of them might be even bigger in size so why we need to compare because we all think that the nanometer size of the particles how this big relative to various uh, things that we see 
in our research area right so bottom of this like you know you see various structures of a wide variety of nano materials so they they look like you know completely different be because they they are in di you know they either they make different method by different methods or maybe they can also be you know based on the their self assembly method they look different because the nature of the material that you use to make nano particles those are different okay so if you see and compare so one micron it contains like 1000 uh, nanometers so if you take any one micron size uh, material like all our hair human hair it's a couple of microns that's what we we could able to see it right but cell you know you do you won't be able to see with our naked eye because those are like you know just 5 to 10 uh, microns in size so this slide is important i think you know uh, srijit mentioned that we will be putting some of the quiz questions uh, later uh, you know during or at the end of the course work will be uh, testing you know how we we'll, how much we learn Uh, or how better I taught you. So it, it's like it's it's a, this is the important slide that you need to consider. So various size ranges of nano materials, and how we can distinguish uh, such nano material versus various other type of materials. Okay. So w what is nano technology basically? it's a nano technology is nothing but a combination of a uh, various other existing fields of uh uh chemistry from physics and biological sciences and engineering okay it's not although it's a you know branched as a new uh area but it's a combination of all these okay so if you don't know how to make or how to conjugate something or how to make this nano construct using some chemistry we won't be able to know right at the same time physics so we'll be considering physics because that is governing the stability or you know feasibility forming uh, from polymer material to a nano material or polymeric nano particle so then engineering or constructing various type of constructs okay at different blocks you take some blocks and then you you put them and then in a different uh, crystal lattice you know engineering and then you make nano material so it's a combination efforts from wide variety of um, areas you know all this biology so where uh, majority of you know earlier on many nano materials like silver gold this nano particle they used to make from the biological resources okay so you have a for example silver salt that is becoming ag0 okay silver zero and no ions that is reduced in the presence of biological system such as bacteria or in the presence of uh, uh, bsa hsa or maybe in the presence of you know any other type of salts so here on your right hand side you can clearly see that nano materials can be applied not only in the biology but also to improve the uh, electronics like you know kind of memory improving okay so silica you know they they deposit silica nano based you know coating on on all your you know mobile devices or uh, computers and so on to improve more uh, its uh, memory on the system at the same time you see this you know kind of like rocket launching on a tumor cells or something right so you see that the kind of like you know we are landing a you know rocket on on a moon right so so this can also be possible that you have a kind of a biological system but you need to detect that are using nano materials or nano technology you conjugate something you know that looks like rocket that go on land on a particular or uh, known area that can sense but somehow and they can go and detect 
you know that's where the precise you know delivery things are happening is of uh, in the nano electronics or in the pharmaceutics but also the same technology can be readily available that can detect you know from your uh, breath or from uh, saliva or from some other you know uh, biological resources you can uh, use them as a diagnostic purpose of the same material okay so apart from all this you can also see that you can improve the strength of the existing materials so for example here we are showing some of the uh, concrete like we we you know cement plus something you know we make concrete but you know if you use more nano filler that again you you can improve the you can improve its further mechanical property of that uh, concrete and so on so this is a basic slide again showing you various uh, types of nano material used in the case of diagnosis and the separation and also therapy you see here like you know why we are showing in in terms of therapy you can be not just by the drug delivery and also you can use for hyperthermia or photodermal therapy and so on based on the nano material that we use okay same diagnosis it could be a mri it is shown here a magnetic resonance imaging but also same uh, various materials can be applied for uh, improving ct contrast agent or improving x ray imaging uh, contrast there are so many other uh, methodologies exist and also you can use you know tracking some of the materials let's say you have some cells that can if you inject those cells in the body they can go and seek or recruit at the particular site such as liver okay so that means it is that cell is uh, have a homing in the liver so what that is indicating as okay so if you take those cells and if you put your some of the nano particles such as magnetic nano particles so if you uh, internalize this nano particle in particular cell and you uh, inject into the mice or in the human so that they can go into the liver so that you can do more contrast based imaging right that's one thing. and also like you know you can do cell isolation and so on cell isolation for example like you know you want to uh, sort out the cells like you have a group of like 10 different group of cells like you know uh, uh, red blood cells white blood cells and you know neutrophils macrophages all those you want to separate right so in those cases what you can do you can have nano particle that they can specifically go and bind uh, very specific cells and then you put the magnet and then you can like separate these are some of the examples we are showing so what's the major obstacle we see uh, in the, in the delivery area particularly okay so for example like you know you so how many of you work on nutraceuticals so so how many of you use nutraceuticals in your research nobody so nobody uses curcumin okay 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 so you know for example like you know you have a let's take curcumin or you know any nutraceutical agents mostly those are non water miscible agents right so what that means like you know you cannot consume just with the water right so that on the other hand those are not uh, soluble in water so if you take organic solvents they are readily soluble but you know unless you are a, you know uh, you know how to drink alcohol then you can drink along with it but not everybody drink alcohol right so that means we have to have some medium that we can disperse your 
neutrocytical agents such as curcumin, resveratrol, and you know, uh, epigenin, you name the neutrocytical agent. Majority, 95% of the neutrocyticals are not miscible in water. So it's better that you make some of the nano materials or you can mix with some of the polymeric material and improve its dispersibility, right? So we'll be learning so various uh, methods how we can encapsulate or load those particular agents into nanomaterials. So both you know uh, through the uh, lecture and also uh, visually or maybe some of you will be involved uh, having hands-on training on those materials. So if you see this slide, so what we are talking about the delivery issues because of the low water solubility and some of the drug molecules. So neutraceuticals are okay that you know those are not toxic to the uh, human being because we already consuming and we don't see any major effect. But when you apply the same you know uh, toxic agents like such as chemotherapy, right? So chemotherapy or maybe uh, if anybody uh, wants to have some of the uh, antiviral agents or any other, you know, drugs, those have more toxicity, right? So how we can minimize the toxicity? Basically, there are two ways. Either you specifically give that drug to the location of where it has to go so that you can minimize the uh, distribution of the that particular drug in other organs. So that's one way. Or maybe you increase its stability or maybe you will be injecting those through formulation that is in your body circulation for more time. Right? So let's say like you know you are giving a drug it is going high in your uh, like this. So if you are giving a drug, majority drug they follow this path, like you know, as soon as you, you have given, the drug is available, but immediately it's gone, okay, from your serum or from the blood it's gone, but the drug by where it was like you know, highest amount, that time your, that drug is already accumulated in various organs, okay, not only the, the site where it has to work, but where other areas also. So that means wherever it is located, then you see its toxicity on those organs. On the other hand, you know, if you make any formulations that can be giving sustained uh, delivery or you have a more stability in your uh, blood circulation, means it is constantly is giving or it is still in your body, but you know, it will be slowly going into the organ where it has to. And on the other hand, so if you take any drug, okay, there are drugs, targeted drugs, or some of them are non-targeted drugs. Okay, targeted drug means like such as, for example, uh, heart to therapy, like when uh, breast cancer patients, they have you know heart to positive uh, protein in their uh, breast cancer cells, so they give heart to antibody. So that means that's a drug, it's a very specific drug that go and bind onto HER2, it doesn't go any other places, okay? Because if they didn't, don't have HER2 positive cells in other organs, that means they don't go there. So that is very targeted delivery, right? If you don't have that targeted drug molecule, then, you know, it's very hard that, you know, that can go into the tumors or tumor tissue. So that's where our nanotechnology would help. The other example is that the other major issue with the delivery of uh, various therapeutic agents is that your cells, okay, this uh, uh, cancer cells are the cells like, you know, infected cells with the viral agent or any other things, those become resistance after a while to a particular drug. So that means cells are already sensing that, okay, or 
they have taking but once they know that this is com drug is coming and then that will uh, spit it out or that will be uh, send it out from the cell okay so we, be, that is happening because those cells will produce more amounts of uh, pgp so pgp protein functions that you know throwing out these drug molecules from the cells so now you see this slide is giving you some of the structures now this some of the size ranges okay for example you see the dendrimer or metal nanoparticles or metal oxide nanoparticles or carbon nanotubes okay so you all might be uh, hearing about these uh, three type of nanomaterials in various fields right so how many of you know either dendrimers or metal nanoparticles or carbon nanotubes it's okay so next range is that you know 10 to 200 nanometer so mostly nanogels polymeric micelles or lipid or liposomal nanoparticles so can you anybody recognize lipid or liposome nanoparticles that you know everybody you know how many of you got a pfizer vaccine or moderna vaccine for covid all of you might be uh, got pfizer right vaccine yeah so that vaccine has a uh, you know nano material lipid based nano material what they use the mrna they put in these lipid nano particles okay that's where so they are effectively able to deliver or on the other hand you can see that they are improving stability of that particular mrna right so because nanotechnology why we want to use basically either improve its stability or activity or we are giving you know sustain release okay any of these right so you can use nanotechnology and the third category is that you know a 100 to 300 nanometer size range hollow nanoparticles polymeric nanoparticles or solid nanoparticles okay the another category would be 100 nanometer to 500 nanometer those are kind of you know bigger size nano particles so here micro particles are micro gels okay so you have been hearing some of the things like when you use your sds space gel that is a bulk gel you can see with your naked eye right and also like you know you see the same material but you can make into very smaller that is micro part particles or micro gel and again further you can use the same material and make it even smaller one that is called nano gel okay here you use the same compound called acrylamide okay the how you make bulk gel micro gel nano gel you would be using either changing a cross link density means like the cross link agent or the amount of the cross link agent or the method you prepare so that you can achieve with the same material but you can uh, make them in different sizes so this is the some of the uh, material that how they look like once you prepare okay so here you see gold nano particles here bottom of this uh, picture you see smaller size bigger bigger and bigger right you can make this way but it's a color contrast you do see a difference right so here you know darker darker and then you, you so you made bigger particle size they give you different contrast right not only here but you know uh, uh, there are many material they have a inherently 
distinct properties based on its size. Okay, so this one example. Okay, so now we know that, and you know, we are interested about nanoparticle preparation. Then what? What is the problem that you come across when you make any nanomaterial? Right. The major issue is that so metal salt. Okay, for example, we talk about metal nanoparticles. Okay. We have a silver chloride or you know uh, gold chlorides. Those are salt, so they are uh, dispersed or they are soluble in water, right? So they are soluble, and then you use some of the reducing agent, either sodium borohydride or ammonia and so on. So they reduce these salts into zero, right? Ag zero or you know uh, gold zero, Au zero. Right? That's well. So you get some of the nanoparticle like this. So the problem comes when they form nanoparticle, they come closer together and they aggregate. Right? If they aggregate, eventually, okay, so you have a very pretty much good uh, dispersion of your nanoparticle. With time, they come agglomerate and then they go down. So that is happening because you have a water that water density is one, right? So your nanoparticle density is going to be more than one. Okay, that's why they are drowning. Okay, let's say now, if anybody wants to have for therapy or contrast agent purpose or any other purpose. If you take that liquid which are precipitated, what's going to happen? The first thing is going to happen, like you know, all uh, the bulk uh, precipitated one, it will be recognize the macrophages and then be, it will be cleared out, those nanoparticles. Means it's no use, right? So that means we need to stabilize them by some means, okay? So what we do particularly, we stabilize with various polymeric materials, okay? So whenever we talk polymeric materials, uh, you, you think something like you are putting a needle, when you are cooking needle, like, you know, those are like tiny uh, snaky structure, polymers are like that, okay? When you put them in water, they are also miscible, but they swell, okay? Nano or that, you know, polymeric uh, chains, they swell, but at the same time, they are a, in a miscible phase, okay? Those kind of coating would help, okay, preventing those aggregation, okay? So that is happening because, so they provide uh, steric or electrostatic uh, hindrance, okay? They are overcoming those, and then, it, those will provide more stabilization to these nanoparticles, right? So the aggregation is happening because of Van der Waal and magnetic dipole or electric dipole interactions, okay? So this is the main uh, cause for aggregation. It's true not only for metal nanoparticles, but various other nanoparticles. And here I am showing you one of the simple example, okay? And you have a cyclodextrin and one of the neutrocytical agent, curcumin. So here you see cyclodextrin is a powder, curcumin is a low color powder. Once you make them self-assembly, and then you will see fluffy based material here. And it's a solubility here, like here it's a crystal clear solution from the cyclodextrin alone. And if you take curcumin, it's not soluble in water. You see all the precipitate at the uh, both bottom and then here on the uh, periphery of the uh, top layer. The same once you make this curcumin cyclodextrin self-assemblies or self-nanoparticles, okay? So those are highly dispersible in water. So that's what we need, okay? The simple way that we want to improve the solubility. Okay, if you see this, 
first issue was low solubility. So that means simply you make nanomaterials of that agent, okay, by self-assembly process or any other processes. So you are improving this solubility. Improving solubility means like you know it will be it will be staying in the, in the circulation that will be giving more amount of time that they can see and go into the area and work as a, a good therapeutic agent. Okay, now only we are still imagining that nanoparticles means only the spherical ones. Okay, it's not necessary that nanoparticles can be any shape. Okay, it could be a spherical or you know, cubical or rods or you know some other designs, you know. Whatever it is, like you know, you do put henna on your hand, it's a different, different, like you know, you can make all those kinds using various methods. Right? So all those, like you know, they have a distinct properties. Either it has a you know solubility, it has a detection. If you make same nanomaterial of distinct structure or morphology, they do have, a, they behave differently or they interact differently on the cells. Okay? So that's a, a one thing that we need to consider. And the next one is the surface charge of the nanoparticles. Okay? Because you see that, you know, for example, you are reducing uh, with the reducing agent and you are making a uh, gold or silver uh, nanoparticles but you are stabilizing with the, some of the polymeric material or maybe polyl lysine or maybe anionic polymers okay some of the neutral polymers and so on that means it is coming on the surface okay some of the a positive or negative or neutral things on the nanoparticle when you are making them, right? They will have all implications when you are using them, okay? So with the time, I think we will be keep uh, explaining those concepts so where it is important. Next, you can see this, like, you know, you can see green layer and then blue layer on the nanoparticle, okay? So what happens, like, you know, you might be using different variety of uh, coating on this nanoparticle that could be hydrophilic or that can be hydrophobic also. They also have a major role uh, of uh, the nanomaterial, okay? And here you see a lot more other things are conjugated on the nanoparticles, okay? It could be a small drug molecule, it's embedded in the nanoparticle core or mRNA or any protein, okay, that for the therapeutic purpose. Or you can use that a ligand or an antibody or an aptamer so that that, ha that can have a more sense that they can go and see that the cell which are expressing particular protein so that they can bind with it. Okay, so for example, if you conjugate uh, folic acid, okay, so if some of uh, the cells they are expressing folate receptors, so that folic acid can bind more effectively with that particular uh, folate receptor. Same way, HER2, HER2 receptor, right? So if you have a HER2 on the uh, breast cancer cells, you know, you conjugate HER with our HER2 antibody then all the nanoparticle construct go and bind there, right? Simple, right? It's, it's a logical, right? Okay. So here, I'm showing you one of the example, okay? Curcumin alone. Cyclodextrin curcumin complex, I showed you it improved solubility, right? Same where we made some of the PLGA-based curcumin nanoparticles, and we'll be giving you training on PLGA curcumin nanoparticle, how we prepare, okay? If I get time, maybe I can also show uh, CD curcumin also, how we can make. 
So same curcumin, we put it in cellulose nanoparticles and dendritic nanoparticles and magnetic nanoparticles. So drug is same, okay? And here all the cells are one same cell that is I think it's a PC3 uh, prostate, one of the prostate cancer cell line, okay? So we put or incubated this equivalent amount of curcumin of the formulation on the cells. Okay. So the activity of the curcumin when you put in other forms, you see that vacuole formation, okay, or you know this is early time point that that's why like the curcumin induced vacuole or you know vacuole formation in the cells. Okay. So here you see a lot more. Then you see even bigger. Right? Here you see even bigger. Here dendromeric bigger. So this MNP it it detached all the uh, cellular components from the cell. Right? So means the drug might be the same but its activity can be directed through various nanoparticles might be different. Right? It's a simple observation that, you know, you can, you know, we're all same, look like same, but, you know, each individual, you have a different potential. Right? So, same thing, like, you know, whatever you're thinking, human body, like, okay, so we have same, like, you know, we have two eyes, one heart and everything, like, but we behave differently, we act differently, okay? Same thing is happening here, okay? It's the same thing, but you know, it acts differently. Okay, so when you talk about uh, cancer applications, okay, so I mentioned like, you know, we will be learning about EPR and active targeting mechanism, right? The first EPR mechanism is nothing but enhanced permeation, and retention. Okay, that means the agent, it will be enhanced traveling through your vasculature and then it is going and locked into your tumor site. Okay, why that is happening? Because like all the tumors, okay, the vasculature is going to be like, you know, you have a blood path through the vasculature, right? So this vasculature will be leaky when it goes to your tumor site, okay? That's where all these nanoparticles, they pump into the tumor, but it will go inside, but it never going to come back. So there you accumulate more amount. Therefore, ideally we have more retention compared to your small molecule drug. So if it is small molecule, Okay, small molecules can come back. Okay, so I will give you, I will show you like here. So let's say this is nanoparticle with the drug. It is going in and it's locked. It's not going to come back. For example, I think, you know, I, I need to go back to see this like glucose. Okay, it's a all small molecule drug. For example, docetaxel, doxorubicin, curcumin, all these things are like, you know, somewhere uh, 300 Dalton or 500 Dalton or 1 KD, right? Very tiny ones. So that means smaller than your nanoparticles, okay? That means even if they go, they can come back, right? Because of very tiny size, drugs will come back. The nanoparticles are always bigger than your drug molecule because that's why you put like, you know, 20 molecule, 30 molecule, or 50 molecule in one nanoparticle, okay? So that's we explore that EPR uh, through this, uh, you know, uh, nanoparticle method. On the other hand, what is active targeting that I mentioned? So if you put any ligand or antibody or optomer that specifically recognize the receptor that are uh, present on the cells, okay? That's another aspect that we can explore. Okay, so this is a busy slide. So what we are going to learn from this is that 
nanoparticle physical properties such as size, geometry, charge, its porosity, elasticity, stiffness and so on. All of them are is going to contribute some way you know how we want to use them. And the structural composition I mentioned like you know dendrimers, cellulose nanoparticles, magnetic nanoparticles or liposomal nanoparticles there are so many means they have structurally different okay so the the composition chemical composition also a driving factor that can help us how we want to deliver the agents and at the end how much we can get the active targeting right all the ligands, it could be a small molecule, antibodies, aptomers, or proteins, or sugars, you know, and so on. Okay, for example, sugars, like, you know, um, uh, so if you take any macro, if you want to target any macrophage targeting, okay, so macrophages, they go to M1 type, and then they go to M2 macrophages, okay. M2 macrophages are bad or that help to grow more uh, tumor cells or tumor growth. So if you want to reverse from M1 to M2, there might be some chemical agents. Or you have a drug molecule that can kill the M2, that also be helpful, right? That means we need to target M2 macrophages in the tumor cells. Okay, so tumor is composed of various cells, right? Uh, Stellar cells, you know, macrophages, and everything. But may in majority of the tumor, there might be up to fifty percent of M2 macrophages. Okay, so if you can tackle those, maybe you can be controlling the tumor growth. So that means if you put any, you know, some of the sugars on the nanoparticle, they can detect more right on the other hand cancer cells they eat more amount of the sugar okay that is because cancer cells uh, they do lot more uh, undergo lot more glycolytic uh, pathway right so that means they need more amount of sugars even if you can target that particular pathway that's again targeted pathway right Okay, so next, so because of all these changes, what if we are going to see the change? Number one, so the nanoparticle, the different structures that you make, so they have a different kind of interactions with the, our uh, serum that is present in the blood, right? Whenever we have, whenever we inject nanomaterials, the first encounter is that those nanomaterials will be masked or they interact with the uh, serum proteins okay and they behave differently right so that means like you know they may let's say alone this nanoparticle without these binding with the human serum proteins they might be this way if they bind more and more and then they can be the other way same way like it has a, a different kind of targeting uh, tumor versus various other organs. Okay? Always we think that you know, we want to deliver more amount of the drug through nanoparticle to the tumors or the infected area or where you want to grow a particular organ. Okay? Some <coughs> someone wants to grow uh, or human, like, you know, what you call, like, <coughs> beta cells, right? So beta cells are responsible, you know, to produce some of the, uh, you know, to tackle the sugar condition, right? So if you want, but the problem would be, so your beta cells is not uh, good enough to produce more amounts of that particular thing. So you want to protect these beta cells to grow more and more, right? So there also we use some of the nanomaterial so that you mask 
to recognize the macrophages to come and eat those uh, beta cells, okay, pancreatic beta cells, okay. So, like all the things, like you know, you make the nano material that you know, either you protect or deliver agents, or you know, it can be a, a regenerative, particularly in the regenerative field, you want to grow particular cells in the presence of these nanomaterials, okay. So, nanomaterial can help, okay, to grow because, you know, the, the encapsulating agents, okay, that can help grow of those particular tissues or cells in that particular arc. Okay, so here is another interesting factor. I said different nanometer size range materials you can make that is interesting for you know observation purpose and so on. But how you use them and what is their inherent property if you make a very small particle like one nanometer or ten nanometer or hundred nanometer or two hundred nanometer. So if you see this, if it is a very tiny nanometer, one nanometer size, they are going to easily cleared by liver. Okay? And if you have a 10 nanometer size range particle, irrespective of the material, but the size it is governing, it will be cleared by the uh, kidney. Right? And whereas, we learn the EPR effect in the in the case of you know tumor accumulation. The size, good size range is like you know about 10 nanometer and up to 220 nanometer. That means like you know if you make any nanoparticle in this range, that is helpful for this, right? On the other hand, if you want to treat any liver type of diseases. You can make one nanometer particle that can readily go there, right? Same way here, like, you know, kidney, if you want to target the kidney, you can make this, right? So this is nature of the, based on the particle size, okay? But doesn't mean that all the nanoparticle is not going to go to the other organs. They are going, but the primary, you know, intention of these nanoparticles the clearing mechanism is based on the size, right? Then it's a solubility. I mentioned like, you know, you put hydrophobic and hydrophilic, right? So that is going to handle the solubility aspects. Then the toxicity is coming from your surface charge of the nanoparticles, right? So if you see higher charge, that means those are toxic to the cells itself. Okay, so how many of you use uh, any transfection agent in your lab to transfect any proteins or gene into the uh, cells? Okay, so do you do any of those? Okay, so if not, so some of the transfection reagents, those are very positively charged. What they do, they make a pores on the cells Therefore, they can get easily internalized, okay? Therefore, they can deliver those mRNA or genes or proteins in those uh, cells, okay? So, in a way, the positivity, more positive charge on the nanoparticle is helping for some molecular uh, uh, studies, but doesn't mean that, that we can apply uh, in the human, right? We cannot apply. What happens because, like, you know, if you take those highly positively charged nanomaterial, inject in the body, what happens? They go and interact first with the human RBCs, right? So that means they lyse those RBCs, right? So you do see a lot of uh, hemolysis and red blood cell death, right? So that means it's not good for the body. So you need to consider, you know, either negatively charged or neutral charged nanoparticles so that, you know, they are not toxic by itself, right? Those should be toxic when you put them any drug into it, right? 
right? Not the nanoparticle itself. Okay. 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 So here is the slide is giving information related to the benefits of the nanoparticles or the strength of the you know the drug molecule that you observe always. This here I given you example with the curcumin. Okay. Curcumin is giving all these inherent property oxy antioxidant, antibiotic, chemo preventive, growth inhibition and you know all these. And it has been proven that it works in animal studies and also it's we all use in a traditional purpose, you know, what what we use, you know, and what it has like you know proven medical uh, implication of that particular uh, curcumin molecule. But if you see what it has weakness, I mentioned like you know solubility, you know some of the stability, all these, you know the weakness and strength of that particular molecule. But you know what we see the opportunity here, how better we can make the same drug molecule into a better version. Okay, so that is giving you here some of the information. So whenever we talk about you know various nanomaterials, the first thing comes to our mind, polymeric nanoparticles. Okay? So polymeric nanoparticle, it could be a naturally derived, derived polymeric nanoparticles or synthet synthetically derived nanoparticles. Right? So you all see like, you know, all the proteins, serum albumins, in our body, those are all natural polymers. Okay, the synthetic materials would be synthetic polymers are all. There are so many, but you know. So here, what we use commonly for biological research, either polylactic acid, polyglycolic acid, or polycaprolactam, or PLGA. It combination of lactic acid and glycolic acid. Okay, that is a copolymer of this PLA and PGA. So we most commonly widely used PLGA nanoparticles. Okay, somehow we can make or you know we know how to make these nanoparticles, right? So you are putting a drug into these nanoparticles. So how they are going to come out? Because uh, we are ap applying some of the method that is encapsulating the drug molecule, but it has to come out from the nanoparticle to work as a drug, right? So after it is it's reaching to the tumor, after it is, you know, like you want to grow your, some of the, you know, uh, cells, okay, ex vivo or in vivo, so you, you will put along the nanoparticle and some of the growth, risk or growth factors, right? So we always supplement growth factors in the uh, medium to grow cells, right? But when you give like, you know, growth factors externally or through the nanoparticles, but those has to come out to do its function, right? So that is happening because either the diffuse of those tiny uh, sized molecules from the network structure of the polymeric nanoparticles or the polymers that what we use PLGA it's biodegradable okay so they have if you see this you see this linkage COO okay it can be cleaved so various biological environment it can cleave that okay therefore like you know the polymeric chains will be chopped out and the your molecule can come out, okay? It's not an instantaneous process, but it takes time, you know, but it all like, you know, it depends like what molecular size we are using, molecular size of the polymer chains that we use to make nanoparticles, okay? Or the method that we use to make nanoparticles, you know? It's all will be depends, you know, how your drug or the agent is going to come out from these network structures. And you can also see with time 
they can come out but you can also apply some of the external stimuli okay so external stimuli means like you know let's say your nanoparticles that what you are making those are ph sensitive or ph responsive okay so that means like you know our body has 7.4 ph right pbs has 7.4 you know if you are let's say you have a all nano material that is going into the tumors okay tumors has a specific ph less than 7.4 sometime it is 6.8 to 7.4 okay or 7.2 so you think that you make a nano material that is when it go under ph 7.2 or 6.8 these will be the polymer uh, chains will be collapsed and the drug will is going to come out so that is one of the you know uh, stimuli response or temperature response okay so in some application or you know for some purposes like you know if we increase the temperature or decrease the temperature the polymer chains okay Uh, for example like you know poly uh, n isopropyl acrylamide okay 37 and below temperature you can make those polymers as a liquid okay so then you increase the temperature from 37 and above so those become gels hard gels okay or bulk gel okay it has a lcst okay temperature 37 lower critical uh, solution temperature okay below that temperature you know you make those uh, solution it's it's perfectly fine just like water so if you increase the temperature same thing will be will becoming uh, you know gel so temperature responsiveness also can be used for our drug delivery purpose okay i'll ge- give you another example so one of the plga uh, polymer based or uh, drug therapy is exist for prostate cancer what they do they make with the, I, i think i have a uh, next lecture i think i have that so i don't want to waste time here so plga you know that you know we make a, a with a, a different you know polymeric chains polymer size range you know the release will be different you know all those but when you talk about magnetic nanoparticle so first we need to think why we want to use magnetic nanoparticles right so we already know that plga is best we can use plga right same way you choose like you no know, different you know toyota cars versus different cars different cars you know what you want right so here that magnetic nanoparticle feature is that it has inherent magnetic properties or it has a magnetization properties okay so it has a magnetization value that is going to be helpful for magnetic separation okay so when you have a magnetic separation means it has a you know you can uh, separate some of the cells based on that or you can apply the same magnetization saturation information to acquire contrast imaging under mri okay magnetic resonance imaging right so we all know that you know if patient goes to a uh, any treatment or any imaging techniques you know they do uh, mri contrast okay so they give they give like some of the uh, barium sulfate or that kind of thing and then they image under mri okay mri has two different type of uh, imaging t1 and t2 but different material will give us a different reading so here that was the advantage of using magnetic nanoparticles on the other hand same magnetic nanoparticles if we apply some of the alternative current okay if you use same nanoparticle you apply magnetic current they produce heat okay so the heat method or uh, you call it as hyperthermia 
So in some of the area, for example, in Germany, they use that as, as itself as a therapy for glioblastoma uh, treatment. Okay. Glioblastoma is a kind of brain tumor. Okay. They inject right into the brain where the tumor is and then they apply a magnetic current and I think I have that example also. So that means like you need to pick a right nanomaterial for your application want, what we want to use. Okay? Same way for regenerative purpose means like you know you want to grow same cells okay, with the help of nanomaterials. Right? In that case either you provide a good environment so that your cells will grow or you give some protection to those particular cells not by eating ma by the macro pages or not clear these cells okay okay so here is the example that you know you have these drug molecules whatever you name it okay you can make this and you put it on the cells it will be internalized after a while okay and then it will be in the cells and you apply permanent magnet so that, that you can make directed delivery to an organ or to a tumor site or where that needs to grow, right? So you can use uh, with the help of magnet, external magnet because if you see this, you have a magnetic solution here and you apply the magnet and the, all the magnetic nanoparticle will go and stick here, right? Same methodology can be applied here also. You inject into the mice and then you put the magnet, external magnet on the organ where that you want to have or you want to see more accumulation, okay? And same, I, I mentioned like, you know, various type of, you know, conjugation of uh, number of, you know, ligands or antibodies so that you can go for targeted way of uh, delivery, like, you know, by recognizing specific receptor, you know, receptor uh, interaction with the, uh, you know, your conjugates. And also at the same time, if you don't have any uh, specific tax on these nanoparticles, anyway, they go by uh, endocytosis pathway, right? So we have a separate lecture of, you know, how various type of nanoparticles, they interact with the cells, various type of cells, how they can get internalized, and how those nanoparticles will be processed further within the cells, right? And another one is, uh, microgel or nanogel, okay? So, we mentioned polymeric nanoparticles. So, how this is different than our nanoparticles, okay? Primarily, it's not much difference because nanogels can also be made by various type of polymers, okay? Or the monomer that we use how to make a PLG and nanoparticles or something, okay? The only difference here, what we do in the case of microgels or nanogels or the bulk gel, only you control the polymeric chains cross-linking, okay? So that way, within the grooves of these, you know, either nanogels, microgels, you know, hydrogels, you see more space here, okay, more empty space, less empty space and less empty space, okay. These are the areas that you can put your drug molecules or biomacromolecules, proteins, peptides, whatever you want, growth factors, what, you know, interferon, gamma, alpha, or, you know, IL therapy, interleukin therapies, whatever you want, okay. The only advan other advantage would be it can work 
best for either hydrophobic and hydrophilic cells. When you think about PLGA nanoparticles, if you want to make formulation for hydrophilic drug molecules, it's an entirely different process. If you want to make you know, hydrophilic one, it's an entirely different process. Here, the advantage would be you can do both type. Okay. And also, we can do some of the self-assembly process. Okay, So there, you polymerize or you take polymeric materials and then you are making nanomaterials. Let's say you, here, you see here, some of the structures, it's uh, self-assembled. Okay, I mentioned cyclodextrins. Okay. So cyclodextrin is nothing but like, you know, a bucket shaped molecule, okay? So your drug molecule go and binds there, okay? And if you see more and more of that thing, and then we found out that, you know, the possibility, various type of assembly, and then you have a, a different type of nanoparticle size, right? So here also, you know, they have a different structure and then, based on the heating and cooling, you will have different structures. And polymeric micelles, again, it's a very similar type of uh, formulation like PLGA. Okay? So, what we do in the case of PLGA nanoparticles, you see the structure here. Um, so, you see the structures, right? It's a simple like PLA and uh, GA, right? As such, you can also use this to make polymeric micelles, okay? So here, if you make polymeric micelles from PLGA, okay? So all your hydrophobic chains, okay, they come together and the hydrophilic chains will be are the outside layer. Okay. Therefore, when you keep them in the water, because of hydrated particle, okay, it still stays in the water. Okay. It doesn't go down. Okay. The only disadvantage would be, okay, you may not be putting a lot more amount of your drug molecule, or maybe drug will come out quickly. Or, on the other hand, Let's say we are not using any thing here to make polymeric micelles. Whenever we talk about micelle, okay, so you all might be learning uh, in your BSc or you know uh, 10 plus 2 to form a micelle. You need to have a, a critical micelle concentration, right? So it's a concentration driven, right? Okay. So we made, uh, for example, polymeric micelle-based formulation. You injected in in the uh, you know mice or in the human. What happens? The first thing is going to be. It is going to be diluted further, right? In the blood, you have a uh, majority amounts is water, right? It's a diluted. So when it is further diluted, what happens? there is no more LC, LC, um, uh, CMC is maintained, right? That means it is going to be detached. So detached means maybe not good for a you know, quick release of the drug, right? It's no, no better than giving a agent, right? So if it is uh, simultaneously detached, the drug will be gone. So to prevent that, we can also put some of the cross-linked based polymeric micelles, or maybe you put like, you know, specific again, you know, ligands or, you know, reactive groups that can bind and then they can do it. So these are some of the examples that I'm giving you, okay? But there are wide variety of nanomaterial that we can think about, apply, 
but only thing that we can do all these things but you know when you have a certain requirement and what research you want right what application you want to use because like you know, if you if you take gold silver or any quantum darts those those are very well good use for diagnostic purpose okay so majority of the diagnostic things would be either ex vivo right so for example we want to see uh, some patient is coming uh, with the disease cancer patient we want to follow up how much uh, you know uh, re he is recovering from the treatment for example any chemotherapy okay so they know that you know particular marker they will be studying from the blood pool right let's say they don't have a good sensitivity for that particular protein you can use your nanotechnology so that you can improve the what you call sensitivity okay you, even if you have very minute picomolar that particular protein you can enhance that sensitivity using gold nanoparticles or that in a quantum dots okay you need to choose a right nano material for your required application okay so that means like you know we cannot finishing up you know giving uh, you know each and one you know experimental wise which type of nano material can be applied for which okay itself it's a course it's a separate course but only thing now through this i know lecture what we need to learn you can make nano materials and it requires okay what surface charge we are giving and what is epr mechanism what is active targeting and you know what type of nano particle size range you now how they will be cleared okay so these basics if you have okay and you need to visualize what's the difference like you know magnetic nano particle how it is better right so i think you know that that much you know understanding would be good enough for us now uh, just to think about nano technology okay forget about you know we use nano technology right away okay so because uh, i mentioned that mrna technology right Lip lipid based nano particle the creators of those lipid based nano particle that came from uh, mit from uh, uh, esa i think you know when i was uh, remember dr sri just submitted this program and he put uh, dr robert langer as a evaluator or the reviewer he was the one uh, creator of that mrna technology okay so he did that work 20 30 years before okay the the concept was there technology was there but you know how we want to use okay for our application okay it's all on you you means like you know whoever is doing the research that they want to apply in a specific field of research okay okay so this uh, i don't want to go more in detail but in stopping now we'll be having a uh, another uh, invited lecture by dr S sabu thomas and we will continue from here uh, uh, to the next class okay so i'll be covering a uh, rest other uh, this chapter and then what more we have a fda approved formulations okay good thank you